Okay, so today is July 18th, 2022. I'm Abby White. I'm going to call this meeting of the Development Review Board in Montpelier to order. As a first matter of business, I would like to take a motion to elect an acting chair for tonight's meeting. Our chair and vice chair are unable to be in attendance. So we need a acting chair to um, lead the meeting. So I will take a motion. Make a motion. I second the motion <laughs> for Abby White to be the chair for this meeting, acting chair in the absence of Rob Goodwin. Okay, so Sharon. I'll second that. <laughs> okay, so, so first by, um, Jean, second by Sharon. Okay, great. So how do you vote, Sharon? Yeah, <laughs> Catherine? Yes. Rob? Oh, no, not Rob. Sorry. Uh, Jean? Yes. And Joe? Joe? Yes. Okay, great. So we have a chair. Now we will proceed with the meeting. Okay, so I'm gonna hand it over to um, you, Meredith, just to review remote meeting procedures and process. Yes, okay. Um, so for everybody looking, attending remotely, I'm gonna be sharing my screen for a minute. This is more, the, the share screen is more for somebody watching via Orca. Um, but for anybody who hasn't done this with us, there's a few little tidbits in for here for you too. Um, so for anyone viewing this meeting via Orca Media, you can participate in tonight's meeting by putting this link into your web browser and it'll open up the Zoom meeting um, and you'll be able to participate through that, um, that so software, that platform, um, be able to see, share screens, talk. Um, you can also call into this phone number and plug in this meeting ID and that will allow you to hear everything over the phone that's going on as well as speak. Um, so e either one of those is a good way to participate in tonight's meeting. If someone is having problems accessing the meeting, please email me, um, mcrandall at montpelier-vt.org. I will be monitoring my email throughout the meeting. Um, for those attending via Zoom, turning your video on is optional. And if you're having issues with lag, often turning your video off through Zoom will allow the rest of the process to keep working. Um, for everyone who is attending remotely, please keep your microphone on mute when you're not speaking. This will reduce background noise and conflicts. Um, please reserve the Zoom chat function for uh, troubleshooting or logistics questions. Keep any substantive comments or questions to verbal. Um, and when you do have a question or comment, you can raise your hand either physically if your video option is on or using the raise hand button on your toolbar. It should be down on the bottom on your Zoom interface. Um, we don't, we just have a few members of the public on tonight. Um, so I'm not gonna worry too much right now about um, comment limits. Um, the chair does have the option to limit time for comments should that arise. If we have a bunch of more people log on. Um, and finally, uh, if I find out through my email that members of the public are having or are not able to get into the meeting and I've worked with them and we can't get them in, we will have to uh, continue the meeting to a time and place certain, which would probably be the next regular DRB meeting. I will now hand the meeting back over to our acting chair. Great. So now we'll move on to approve the agenda. Is there a motion to approve the agenda as published? So moved. Thanks, Catherine. Is there a second? second. Thanks, Sharon. Okay, Joe, how do you vote? Oh, he's there, but Joe, we can't you... hear him. He may have lost audio. So okay. Okay. Oh. Yeah. oh, great. Yes. All right. Yes. Gene, how do you vote? Yes. 
Uh, Sharon? Yes. Catherine? Yes. And I vote yes as well. So we have an agenda. All right, next comments from the chair. No comments for me this evening. So we will next review and approve meeting minutes from the last meeting, which was June 20th. I believe the only folks eligible to vote are uh, myself, Sharon, Catherine, and Jean. No, Catherine, I, you weren't here. Process question. I came on late. I was, uh, yeah. That's okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Oh, she was here. She just, yeah. Yep, that's fine. All right. So is there a motion to, uh, or any, any, um, is there a motion to approve the agenda? Let's or, make a motion to approve the agenda. Oh, sorry, the, the minutes. Minutes, sorry. All right, thanks, Sharon. Is there a second? Second. Thanks, Catherine. Okay. So, Jean, how do you vote? Yes. All right, Sharon? Yep. Catherine? Yep. And I vote yes as well. So the minutes are approved. Okay, great. So moving on to um, the, the two different applications. We're first gonna start with 401 Parkway Street, Hubbard Park. And so uh, what I'd like to do is turn it over to Meredith just to provide an overview of this application. And are there are there witnesses with this one as well? Um, yeah, once I give the overview, we can swear in the witnesses okay. at that point, I think. But there's a there's a witness or two. Um, yeah, I mean, we've got the applicant, we've got Kara, who might okay. be, she's a, um, and then, uh, I don't think we have anybody else. I do have, well, let me let me do my overview. Do the overview. Um, okay. So, um, this application um, from the City of Montpelier Parks, uh, department is coming before the development review board because it includes work within the 500 foot vernal pool buffer. So that's what triggered development review board um, review. Um, the It would have required a zoning permit anyway, because it also triggers um, minor site plan review. Normally that would just be administrative. Um, but the whole whole thing is coming here for the to the board because of that vernal pool buffer, and it just didn't make sense to split it up. Um, because this is work that is part of a municipal facility, really the the whole parks network there at Hubbard Park, um, our the, the planning departments and the DRB's zoning authority or regulatory authority is limited by 24 VSA 4413, and I've outlined that in the staff report. Um, but the wetlands review, because it includes this setback situation, setbacks are one of those very specific items that zoning is allowed to continue to regulate um, under 4413. So I really, I, I, didn't, I didn't see any way to say, no, they're exempt. Um, it just didn't work for that. So this is one of those things that because we do have regulatory authority, we have to go through the process. Um, so, uh, but there are certain things as noted in the staff report where we're not allowed to have zoning authority over certain things um, because the the list is is very, very specific. So things like stormwater controls, there's no language in the statute that lets us look at those and and regulate them really at all. Um, the the application makes clear um, how they're dealing with those, but those aren't things that we can put conditions on. Um, we do have some comments that I circulated via email and I have printed copies here in the um, council chambers. We had comments from um, a final letter from the Montpelier Conservation Commission on the project. Um, so the just a note that the Montpelier Conservation Commission doesn't have um, a specific clause to re in our zoning regulations that pulls them in to review this, but the parks director wanted to get their input on the project. Um, so it's still advisory, but even sort of a lower level advisory than normal when their review is specifically triggered, um, but they, they have input. Um, so they're sort of, it's more considered sort of a public comment in some ways at this point. Um, and then we also have a comment from an abutting property owner. So when 
the acting chair feels like they want me to read those into the record, I can. Alec, um, the applicant, has gotten copies of these comments as well. So um, that's that's what I've got. Um, so I'm thinking, Abby, probably swear in our witnesses that are online, and then the applicant can present their okay. product. Their is it better? the applicant not going to start with a service? Overview. Well, but then the overview wouldn't be testimony if they're not sworn in. Okay. So we got to swear them in. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. I thought you were going to start with other people. Alec, Alec Ellsworth is the applicant. Okay. He's the okay. parks director. Okay. So, yep, yeah, that's what I was going to say, Alec. But but we've got to swear them him in first and swear everybody in. Great. Okay. So do we do it as a group or do we do it? As... Uh, so everybody for this application as a group. So Alec okay. and Kara... If you could unmute and if you want, turn on your video. Um, and Abby is going to swear you in because you're giving testimony if you speak. Okay. So do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth under the pains and penalties of perjury? I do. I think that was a yes from Kara. <laughs> if you speak, yes. Okay, great. Okay. So that's it. Awesome. So, so Alec, would you like to just provide an overview of the project? Sure, I'd be happy to. Thanks Thank for uh, taking the project on here. So um, the project came to light as part of the city's ADA transition plan, um, which I believe was adopted in 2018. Um, the city hired an outside consultant to go through all city facilities and identify where um, where we could make things more accessible, um, what were the low hanging fruit and what were some of the biggest projects. And for each facility, um, they made priority rankings. So one of the facilities was Hubbard Park, um, access to the park's premier feature, which, was a, which is the tower, uh, was put as a highest priority level um, for you know, folks who need accessible accessibility, uh, accessible areas. So we started um, thinking about how to provide that and um, combined it with a project that we had cooking already, which was to refurbish an existing interpretive trail in the park. Um, and uh, in the fall of 2020, we uh, went to the Parks Commission to propose a project uh, in order to be able to apply for the Recreational Trails Program uh, grant through the state of Vermont. They approved the project, we applied, we were successful and have been working through the permitting since then. Uh, we got a wetland permit from the state for one area that needs to go through a wetland, uh, working through this permit, obviously. We um, put the trail design build out to bid uh, over the winter of 21-22. We hired um, a firm called Timber and Stone, um, which uh, in my opinion is the best trail building company in Vermont, uh, maybe in New England, and definitely some of the top uh, trail builders in the country. They've done projects all over the region, including you know, like 60 stone stairs down to the base of Niagara Falls and the accessible boardwalk at the um, Smuggler's Notch, um, really high profile projects, and they're based out of East Montpelier. So we're really happy that their bid came in competitive, um, and they've been working on us, working with us on the design um, since since the winter, um, from the winter through, through now. Um, the project fits into a bigger context, um, going back to the ADA transition plan. Um, there were a number of uh, items in there for Hubbard Park, including making one of the shelters accessible, having an accessible outhouse, um, having accessible parking, all things that we currently lack. Um, so the plan, this, this project fits into a bigger plan for the new shelter, which uh, if you don't know what the new shelter and the old shelter is, like most people, the new shelter is the one that's at the end of the road um, or the one that's not at the sledding hill. Um, so that shelter has, we put a lot of work into making it accessible to access in and out of the shelter last year and put accessible picnic tables in and um, we're planning to add this trail and then we're also planning to add a accessible composting toilet in the fall through uh, ARPA funds. So um, it's, it's a 
you know, uh, definitely a big project and um, it's uh, exciting for us for the park. And the last sort of benefit is that it will help us close down a number of trails that have just popped up, um, you know, their deer paths or whatever that turned into recreational use paths that are not professionally designed and fall right down the grade and are subject to erosion. So in addition to putting in this nice professionally built trail, we're looking forward to getting rid of the other ones. All right, thanks, Alec. Are there uh, questions from the board? Sharon, go ahead. Um, I guess I, I had one question about, um, I noticed that there was uh, some question about whether they were both vernal pools or whether one was a forested wetland area on the map. So Alec, why don't you speak to the site conditions and then I'll speak to how we regulate under that, con under that provision, does that work? Sure, yeah, so the, um, let's see, the area in between the new shelter and Hubbard Park and the tower, um, at the bottom near the new shelter is um, what I believe is in zoning as a vernal pool on our, on our map, our natural resources map, um, that we have some interpretive signage around it. There's actually, you know, the, the driveway to the new shelter goes right by it. Um, and so the trail actually, the closest the trail goes to the vernal pool is 120 feet, which was not close enough to require us to get a permit from the state, um, but it is close enough for the city because of the 500 foot um, limit. And from there it um, goes uphill. And so a, a universally accessible trail needs to meet certain uh, grade standards. So, um, it needs to be like you can go any distance for under five percent and then smaller distances above that, um, that that are all delineated in the accessible trail guidelines in between about halfway between the new shelter and the tower there's a large forested uh, wetland um, that is we had delineated as part of our um, process with the state unfortunately because we couldn't get we couldn't stay outside the buffer of that wetland and keep the grades at what they needed to be to maintain that universally accessible standard. We needed to basically cross one of the outlets of that, that wetland. Um, and so that's what we needed the permit for through the state. We had a site visit with Shannon Morrison, the state wetland um, specialist, and she helped us through the permitting process. And we now have a permit to do a culvert or bridge over that area um, and then continue on upward after which we have no uh, wetland impact. So. As far as what the second vernal pool is, I'm not uh, I'm not familiar with the second vernal pool. But is that the same thing as the wetland? Meredith? Right. Yeah. 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 So on our on the natural resources inventory map, uh -huh. the um, the the forested wetland where you're getting the wetland general permit for that work, yeah, is noted as both a sort of protected natural community and a vernal pool on our map, and okay. that's the the city is bound to regulate to our map in this mm -hmm. provision yeah so so that even though <laughs> even though they get a, a wetlands permit for that work yeah our our regulations specifically say that even if you have a wetlands permit you know state permit for that work if you're in the vernal pool buffer for yeah. our map you still have to go through the vernal pool analysis <laughs> okay yeah. We have to basically, the, the Montpelier Conservation Commission is responsible for updating the map. So they have to update the map before we can change okay. how we regulate it. Thank you. But you can, you know, the, the criteria for meeting that vernal pool buffer requirement, it doesn't say you have to meet all of them. These are the considerations as applicable given what's happening on the ground. Okay, I'm just confused there. Yeah. But did, did that make, I mean, yeah. I tried to explain it in the staff report, but it is still confusing. <laughs> no, that was helpful, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Alex. Other questions from the board? Uh, yep. <laughs> Go for it. Go ahead, Sharon. Alex, have you had a chance to look at the conservation report that came in or the report from the, uh, Conservation Commission that came in. 
I have looked at their letter. Yeah, um, okay. that is all. Everything that they requested is totally um, we were going to do anyways. We have no intention of cutting any large trees or changing the canopy at all. Um, we are going to, you know, the trail will will seamlessly interact with the surrounding woodland so that amphibians can cross over it. Um, there are a couple places where it's up against ledge where we'll need to put some large rocks to hold the trail in, but amphibians wouldn't be burrowing into rock anyways, as far as I know. Um, so those, you know, those areas uh, are small and wouldn't be suitable habitat anyways. So everything that they outlined, we are already doing. So happy to, happy to comply. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, I do have a question, Alec. I'm wondering if if you contemplated other designs and what led you to kind of settle on this one. Other designs in terms of the trail route? Yes. Yeah, so the, I mean, the Tower Road is obviously the, the most, uh, seemed like the best route because it's already gravel, you know, the surface itself could be made to be accessible, but the grades um, are way off the requirements for that trail. Um, so we needed an alternate route. And rather than just doing a bunch of little loops off the tower road, we thought it would be a much better trail experience to actually create this whole new trail that also you know, was an interpretive trail, which we wanted to do anyways, that paralleled the tower loop so that could be um, you know, enjoyed by most people um, in a loop you know, people who actually need the accessible component, it'll be an out and back. But for us, we decided because we wanted to do this interpretive trail, we're gonna keep them separate. We're gonna make them both park features. And um, there are a number of side benefits to it too, like, um, you know, for Enchanted Forest, our big event in the fall, we'll now have a really lovely loop instead of an out and back. Um, and it's, you know, the trail will likely be able to be groomed for skiing in the winter. So it'll be a year round use trail. Um, and other than that, you know, there, there really was not a good way to get to the tower because it's, you know, <laughs> at the top of the hill. It's, uh, it's hard to get to. Um, all the other approaches are much steeper. Okay, thanks. It also um, sounded like from the application that constructing this trail enables you to take some other trails out of commission. What will that change have like overall on the impact on, on the vernal pools in the park? Um, so let's see, um, the, the trail will actually remove, we're actually coming further away from that upper, upper vernal pool or wetland um, than the old trail did. Um, so uh, we only go through the 50 foot buffer and across about six foot of the outlet to the wetland, whereas the other trail actually goes into the buffer and into the wetland on um, the existing trail. So we're going to remove all that. Um, unfortunately, we didn't get any credit for that <laughs> with our wetland permit or with this, um, but it is a good thing anyways. I mean, the other side of that is that, you know, it's going to be a very different character of trail because this one will be, you know, much more built up in the sense that it has like a gravel surface, um, whereas the other one is just like a, a natural earth surface. Um, yeah. But, you know, I think as far as I know, oh, hang on, I got a good night coming in. Um, as far as I know, the, um, the, the impact will be, you know, similar to what it is now or less. <laughs> oh. This is my we can keep going. You don't have to. You don't have, you don't have to stop on my account. It's okay, Alan. Oh my gosh. <laughs> You've got a, got a lot of people with kids on. <laughs> uh, don't forget. Let me know when you're here to. You want me to see Lisa's something with the record that was public comment to me about it or just summarize it. Okay. That sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. All right. Yeah. Yeah. So um <laughs> we'll move we'll move on for for now. Um yeah I'm, I'm good to go. Uh, sorry. I'm good to go here. <laughs> okay. 
All right, great. Thank unless you. For you that. To, unless you have to swear him in too. No, I think we're <laughs> I think we're good. So so Meredith, would you mind um, summarizing the the email we received from Lisa Burns? Yep. So uh, and I sent this to Alec as well. Um, so Lisa Burns is an abutting property owner, and um, she sent an email. Um, I'm gonna try to summarize. She has two main concerns. Um, one was site selection. So at where the trail actually runs, where the new trail is actually going to run. Um, and, you know, having both environmental concerns about it going through um, the wetlands area and a stand of large pines um, over ledge. Um, anyway, ver various issues around that. I did send this around to all the, the the board members um and yeah i'm sorry it's in also concerns about if a suitable route is located that it will need to access the accessible toilet um and finally ended the non-ada compliant hubbard park tower also worried that it will not be a loop and so that the um people using the that need the universally acceptable trail would have to go back down the same ground um, she said her second concern was haste of the project um, and that the fact that the Parks Commission um, is looking to begin the project as soon as possible and completing it in time for Enchanted Forest. Um, I think she just felt like it wasn't enough time for consideration. Um, and also about the um, whether or not the trail would be able to be maintained. So. Okay. So Alec. So Alec, I'm wondering yeah. if there's any if there's any um, response you'd like to make to those questions. And sure. Yeah, uh, I'd be happy to. Um, so uh, in terms of timeline, um, like I said in my intro, you know, we put this in front of the Parks Commission in the fall of 2020, um, and we went through grant application or pre-application. We went in front of the Parks Commission again. We got the grant. Uh, we've been through multiple permitting processes that require, you know, letters to abutters, uh, public comment periods. We have I've had an update to the Parks Commission and my staff update to them every time since, you know, the pre-application in the fall of 2020. So, uh, you know, I, I appreciate that people can, it can feel rushed if you just found out about it. But you know, from my perspective, we've been working on this for almost two years and are now getting close to construction. Um, in terms of uh, the actual route, um, you know, I, I'm sympathetic to Lisa's point of view. Um, you know, we we can see we could see to this idea as a staff. We mapped it out roughly. We got the grant, and then we hired a professional to tell us if it could be done or not. And you know, what they told us is that it could be done, and then this is how much it's going to cost. Um, we had a bid process, you know, where the where the route was published and did a walkthrough with all the bidders. Um, so people had an opportunity to um, see what, you know, what the project was and we still got multiple bids. So, you know, I, I, I'm, uh, you know, both sympathetic to the point of view and also have been told by people that know what they're doing that this is possible. Uh, I trust their opinion. That's why we hired them. Also had a you know walk through with the state wetland specialist who who didn't seem concerned about it either. Um, the I'm not sure about the accessible outhouse. What that comment is about, um, it will dovetail with the accessible outhouse, which has not been built yet and be by the new shelter. Um, and um, in terms of the maintenance, um, we are actually trying to get rid of the exact trails that I think Lisa is referring to because they're not built by the staff. They're you know, just beat in trails that are not sustainably routed. Um, so we don't maintain them on purpose because we don't want to. Um, they're not good trails. Any any maintenance that we would do would be to close them down. Um, so that's that's our goal as part of this project is to, you know, make the trails in the park that we have easier to take care of and easier to maintain and, and last much longer. Um, yeah, were there any of her okay. concerns that I missed? Or was that it? I think I think you covered it, Alec. Thank you for that. Okay. Um, so I 
Go ahead, Meredith. Okay. There's somebody who's signed on partway through, and actually, I think we've got Joe coming back in. Um, Michael Pavey. That's my husband. Oh. Uh, okay. My kids were upset. Uh, me. Oh, 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 oh. So it's this, this is so your kids can see you. That's awesome. <laughs> we're having okay. a kid night. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Oh my gosh. And then, uh, Joe, that's you coming back on on eight five six. Yes, it is. Okay. Awesome. All Thank right. you. And there was one additional witness who wanted to speak. Uh, well, that was uh, so. Kara is on. Kara, did you have anything you wanted to add? She worked for the Parks Department. Okay. Um, no, thank you. I'm I'm here as a, a witness. Okay. So if we have okay. questions that that you need to to, to answer, awesome. All right. Thank you, Kara. So thank you both. Any additional questions for either Alec or Kara uh, from the board? I had one. Yeah. Go ahead, Catherine. Um, I think it, there wasn't too much in the application around the nature of the um the interpretive signage and that kind of user experience especially around the ecological features and especially we're here talking about the vernal pools so it'd be great to, if you're able to share anything around the interpretive signage at a high level that might help us understand the project even more yeah um so the the interpretive signage is designed around the woodland wetland wildland book um if you're familiar with that it's sort of the textbook for natural communities that's put out by um anr they just released their second edition last year and it basically catalogs all of the natural communities in Vermont. Um, and our trail has those three categories. Um, there's five signs per category. And then there's a fourth category that has to do with park history. Um, so um, there should be about 20 signs along the route. They'll be placed, you know, uh, per the guidelines and accessible trail buildings so that they can be viewed by, by everybody um, and everybody. And on each sign is, you know, interpretive material. And then also um, every sign has a some element of a Beneke language um, and history on it, just to weave in the natural history and the, the, and the human history together. Um, so those signs are, are almost all done. Um, we've been sort of doing the, the signage and the trail part in, in parallel. Yeah, signage is one of those things that Oh, we, can we can't oh we can ask about it. that's well i mean you can ask about it but it's not something that we can really regulate for yeah. municipal entities unless you're talking about that's oh. review off of the parcel because then that's considered a little oh, more of oh. actual sign versus interpretive um guidance right so it's more of a guidance thing versus if we have regulations about size and height and location of actual commercial signs those we could regulate yeah that makes sense cool. so okay interesting nonetheless yeah, though, yeah. to yeah. hear well, about the signage part of the project yeah it, it is. helps us understand oh, it is which is why i i wasn't yeah i wasn't interrupting the question but i was like <laughs> we don't actually need that for the approval no. so it really seems like the the main issue before this the DRB is whether the project meets the no undue adverse impact on vernal pools. And so I wonder if any member of the board have any kind of initial thoughts on that. I mean, based on what um, this testimony and what's included in the in the um, staff report, um, I am not reading any undue adverse impact. I'm wondering if others are as well or would have more questions about that. I'm not either, Abby. I, I'd like to entertain a motion if this is going to go into deliberation. Well, that was going to be my second question if um, we wanted to do deliberative session on this or not. I don't think it's necessary. You don't think? I think yeah. we could just go with a motion. Okay. Yeah. And that's Joe. How do you feel about did you have any questions about the wetlands criteria or the vernal pool criteria? No, I think I'm all set. Okay. All right. Well, in that case, yes, I will uh, entertain a motion on this application. So, the actual motion for approval. Motion to approve, yes. And so the language is um, there's a suggestion in the staff report on page 11 of the staff report. Yep. 
so move the motion to grant the minor sand plan approval for a universally accessible trail inside Hubbard Park, including granting the requested 3006D waiver for disturbance inside Bernal Pool buffer zones as presented in this application and supporting and supplemental materials. Second. Thank you, Jean. Second by Sharon. Okay. So how do you vote, Joe? Yes. Jean? Yes. Sharon? Yes. Catherine? Yes. And I vote yes as well. So, so thank you all. Awesome. Uh, Alec, we will get you the uh, decision as soon as possible. And because there were no conditions of approval, we'll be able to issue the zoning permit as soon as I get a decision signed by the acting chair. So get it to you as soon as we can. Great. Thank you. Thank you all for your time. Thank you, Alec. Thank you. Good night. Okay, great. Thanks, everyone. So we'll be moving on to our second application. Uh, 579 Gallison Hill Road. The applicant, Mary Frances McClellan. So this is a final review of a three lot subdivision. And we had a sketch plan review on this a month ago. Okay. Approximately. Yes, Approximately. Yeah. All right, so um, so Meredith, I'll just ask you to give a brief overview as you know, this is something yep. we've already seen. And so if there's just highlight any changes maybe that have, that might have um, changed, yeah. things that might yeah. have changed yeah. since we first um, saw it. So as you said, this is a final review of a three lot subdivision. Um, so the board is at this point tasked with actually making a decision on it. Um, there, There's really, not much of anything that has changed other than that additional information has been provided, um, especially in the areas that the board had requested that information on before. So um, the board will need to make a the semi-formal determination about um, which are the side and front parcel boundaries for um, the, the parcels A and B, proposed parcels A and B, um, because that did fall into some of the other determinations. Um, and then the two of the areas where there's some supplemental information are um, about the driveway locations, the, the potential for driveway locations, and whether or not the parcels um, should have individual driveways or a shared driveway. So there's additional information in here about the applicant's choice, um, as well as some additional information about um, the mitigating impacts on a natural community that's down in one of the far corners of one of the proposed parcels. Um, and then the board's also going to need to make a determination about whether or not to impose any landscaping requirements on future um, zoning permits. We've done that before in some of these small um, subdivisions. It's just one of those items that the board's going to need to call out. Um, but there's no big changes to the actual plan from the sketch. Okay, thanks, Meredith. Um, and we've got, I think, just the two witnesses to swear in. So John, okay. our engineer from DeWolf, and the applicant, Mary McClellan. All right, great. So I'll go ahead and swear you in. So do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth under the pains and penalties of perjury. Yes. I do. Okay, great. So who who would like to lead us off in a in an overview? If uh if you're okay, I'll I'll take that uh the lead here, Mary. Thank you so much. Okay. Um and I guess I, uh, I'll share my screen if that's okay with folks. Sure. Awesome. So uh, here is the, um, the proposed subdivision plan. And actually maybe I want to start with a uh, larger view showing um, it in the area. So 
here's the the existing 1.74 acre parcel. Um, this is the ex existing home that uh, Mary lives in right now. And so the proposal is to, um, you know, break it into three properties with one on the left and one on the right of the existing parcel. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, the, it is the residential 9,000 district. And I think the smallest lot is this parcel C, which is um, 13,000 some odd square feet, which is basically one and a half times the minimum lot area, whereas these lots are substantially larger than that. Um, and they're, it's subdivided in this way to um, allow for, you know, building on a, a nice level area in, for each potential um, lot. There are steeper, there are steeper areas around the side of this lot here, and it gets quite steep in the back. And this core, this reddish um, area is uh, mapped on the uh, city of Montpelier natural communities map. And you can see that it just nicks this, cor this um, acute corner of um, this uh, Eastern lot. And so, but this is in an area that would, is, would, it's undevelopable, it's outside of the, um, or it's, it's within the, uh, the setback lines. Uh, so there, and it's, it's a steep uh, area, so it could not be developed. Uh, the one th thing that I wanted to mention is that uh, Meredith uh, said that there were very few changes to the, um, from the sketch plan, and that's true that in that I don't believe that the boundaries of the uh, lots have changed at all. They're exactly as they were on the, um, the sketch plan submittal. The only thing that I've changed here is the, um, the setback lines. Um, and I am showing the setback lines um, per the discussion that was had at sketch plan. And this, so I am showing this as a side setback, 10 feet. Um, and that was something which um, uh, Meredith noted is up for the board to, um, you know, make a determination on. Uh, the other, like, a, a, I guess the requested additional information was regarding the driveways. And so we did, we have, we've looked at the driveways for each lot. And this, the, these dashed lines, I'm showing like a, a, a potential driveway, which could um, be developed on, say on this parcel A. And this, uh, I have looked at the, um, the profile grade as well as the required cut and fill um, that would all be uh, able to be developed entirely on this parcel. And it would meet the city of Montpelier driveway standards as well as the state of Vermont B71 residential driveway standard. And the same goes for the driveway that which is shown um, ap approaching a, a building area on parcel B. Now, um, at sketch plan, um, there was comment about um, that uh, shared driveways are encouraged, that um, they're not required by the board, but they are encouraged. And so they wanted us to um, look at it and, you know, just determine why we're proposing separate driveways uh, as opposed to having a shared driveway. And so, you know, if you look at, um, the topography of, can I zoom in this way? Yes. If you look at the topography in, in this area of the, this part, this proposed parcel, it is quite steep. And there's this an existing driveway, um, which um, comes out of the, uh, you know, the, this porch area. And it, that's extremely steep. Um, so the proposal here is to, abandon uh, this steep driveway and, and allow for the purchaser of this property to develop, to develop a 
more reasonable approaching driveway. And so we think that it would be difficult to um, create a driveway here, which would be shared um, and, and not have some steep portion to it. And, and so if we look at the, this is the existing driveway, which we're recommending be just maintained as is, as the um, driveway for parcel C, uh, the existing home. Um, and we're showing this driveway potential location for um, the this parcel uh, B. Anyway, the, you know, so if this were to be the shared driveway, then um, the, you know, the potential resident of parcel uh, B would end up being driving quite close to the existing home, um, you know, so uh, that seems to be an, not a desirable approach for a shared driveway. Um, and so, you know, it just seemed that if you were going to um, develop a, another driveway here, it might as well be a separate driveway for the for the final parcel, as opposed to having like abolishing this and making this a shared driveway seemed like um, that would be like uh, you'd, you'd lose the um, the benefit of each resident having uh, their own uh, driveway that they don't have to, um, you know, enter into any kind of maintenance agreements or, you know, uh, come to agreements about who's responsible for plowing. And, you know, it seems that it's, it is allowed in the rules uh, to have separate driveways for each lot. And it seems to be the most sensible um, solution to this proposed three lot subdivision. And I guess with that, I'll stop talking unless uh, uh, I have a question. To ask any questions. Or... I have a question on the adjacent to parcel B. You have a, is there any existing landscape buffer there through, through the property line? So uh, maybe it'd be best to look at the ortho photo, which I have here. Thank you. Sure. So um, you can see this is a, tr a treed area here um, in the front, you know, or near Gallison Hill Road. Whereas there is, um, at least at the time of this ortho photos, there's, it's, um, you know, there are some other, looks like there's some other trees here and down the slope there, but there is a, a, a fairly um, large clearing here on this lot. Um, it's, and then there, there are, over on this side, there are some, this is treed as well. Um, it's, does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Okay. All right, other questions from the board for John? Just. Go ahead, Sharon. Um, just one quick question. Is the driveway on lot A, is that on the existing curb cut? The existing curb cut um, for lot A is here in this finer line and then cross hatched okay. there as a um, proposed to be abandoned. Okay, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Other questions? So I, I just kind of going to the issues that um, Meredith outlined, seems like the first one is, is around uh, the side, the side boundaries. Yeah. And so I think, um, you know, the question is really, does the board agree that the, you know, the property lines closest to the barn on parcel A are side boundaries? Yeah, so that'd be parcel A and then the similar bent lines on parcel C. B. Okay. Or B, sorry. A yeah. A and B, because C is the one in the middle. Yep. Yeah. So okay. I get confused as well. <laughs> yep. I, I my thinking when I reviewed that was that in as much as possible, we should try to use frontage as the orientation. And so 
each one of those properties have a certain amount of frontage required. And so that makes other things beside. Yeah. Okay. So I'm hearing Sharon say, yes, I kind of agrees with this, the staff recommendation. And I, I see it similarly. Does, does anybody on the board have a contrary view? Okay. Driveway locations. Any um, thoughts, concerns, questions from the board on those? John, I thought your description of, of and kind of the laying out the reasoning behind each of them was useful. So thank you for that. Thank you. Any 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 other questions for the board? No. Okay. And then the last question is around landscaping. Is that is that right, Meredith? Um, that we need to look at. Am I'm I just, missing any? I'm just I'm just getting through to make sure. So landscaping, um, and then the board will need to actually just make you know confirm their determination about the um natural resources. So those two things are what's left. Yeah. Okay. The landscaping, because that's a condition item, and then just confirm the um that the project either uh has been designed to avoid or minimize and mitigate adverse impacts to the natural resource area. All right. So those two items. So let's take the landscaping first. Um, so I'm looking at page, let's see, what page are we on? Page 14? 13. 13. 13 okay. of the Start, staff It report. starts on page 13. Yeah. Okay. So can I ask Meredith a question about this? Yes, go ahead. Um, I just want to make sure that I understand this correctly, that if there are, if those are single family units that are put up there, they won't come under any further review. Correct. If it was anything but single family unit. Um, so anything except for single or two dwelling units. So it could be, two dwelling units in separate or a duplex, what everybody thinks of as a duplex, that also does not trigger site plan review. So does not trigger further landscaping and screening evaluation. Okay, so so basically if we don't insist on landscaping now, we wouldn't have a chance to. Unless, unless it is over two units. Yep. Which my way of thinking doesn't seem horrible, but. That doesn't seem horrible to condition yeah, landscaping. No, to, to that seems reasonable. Yeah. You know, there I'm getting caught up in the do double negatives. So, Gene, are you saying it seems reasonable to condition landscaping? No, I'm I'm agreeing with. Uh, with you the, agree with Sharon that it doesn't I'm, seem reasonable. Yeah, that it doesn't seem required. Yeah. Okay, I agree too. To okay. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's not like the one we had down on. Um, I know that one. In the Ewing. meadow. In the meadow. Well, there's Ewing, and there's also the one. There was one in the meadow that was pre. I don't think I don't think any of you were on the board when we first started doing this. There was a one of the first two parcel subdivisions that got triggered under these these regs, um, where it was in the meadow. And it was going to be so the lot size, minimum lot size is really small, and it was going to be two dwelling units really close to each other on two different parcels. And it, 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 the board at that point said, mm, we want to make sure when you actually come back with your house site plan for the what what's currently going to be a vacant parcel, that some kind of landscaping gets triggered. But that was for that specific instance. These are much bigger parcels. Yeah. Okay. So I'm I'm hearing that um, we're not interested in having that condition. Okay. okay, and then natural resources and attempts to avoid disturbance. Um, based on the map that you provided and the teeny tiny corner, it it does seem as if. You've uh, 
you've designed it in a way that does avoid. <laughs> yeah. So no concern. Can't build in that corner, right? Yeah, <laughs> you can't build in yeah. that little teeny tiny corner. Yeah. So maybe somebody could put a deer stand at most. Like that would be it. <laughs> okay. Okay. All right. So any other questions from the board? For John or for Mary? No. no? Okay. How does the board feel about deliberative session on this or doing taking a, a take a motion if, if we don't want to do that? Like it looks like oh, go ahead. No, I was just gonna say just a reminder, it looks like we so the on page 16 and 17 of the staff report is a draft motion. And we would just get rid of the first condition. We'd still need the yeah. second condition, but that's it. Okay. All right. So I'm not hearing any strong desire to go into deliberative session on this. So I will take a motion on this application. So moved. The motion to approve application number Z-202-0069 Oh, we lost you, Jean. I think your microphone shut out. For a three parcel subdivision of 579 Gallison Hill Road, as presented in the application, submitted on June 21st of 2022, and supporting materials subject to the following conditions of approval. Within 180 days of this decision, applicants shall record the final survey plat in the Montpelier Land Records Office. Per the procedures detailed in 4405 of the zoning regulations, including the locations of all applicable survey rods and markers. Seconded. All right, thanks, Joe. Okay, so Sharon, how do you vote? Uh, in favor. Catherine? Yes. Joe? Yes. Jean? Yes. And I vote yes as well. Great, so awesome. thank you everybody. Uh, so Mary, John, uh, similar to the um, prior, because there's no conditions for getting the, the permit, um, once we've got the decision written and signed off by the um, acting chair, we'll be able to issue the decision and the zoning permit on the same day. Um, and then when you have the final plat ready, I will need the mylar for that. Um, and I will coordinate getting um, Abby, the, the chair's signature on that mylar. And then I will submit it upstairs in the clerk's office to be recorded. Those recording fees were already paid as part of the application fee for this permit. Okay, okay. thank you very much folks. Thank, thank you. you. Great, thank you. Thank you board. Okay, so that concludes our meeting. When is the next meeting of oh, this board? That somehow didn't get put on here. Um, oh. <laughs> normally it's on the agenda. It's like, uh, the next meeting is Monday, August 1st, and we do have um, uh, application for that. Um, we actually have items for both the August 1st and the August 15th meeting. So there will be no resting on laurels for the next few meetings. Okay. Um, and August 1st is also the date that we go through the formal process of electing um, chairs and vice chairs for the annual positions, just so that everybody's aware. Okay. All right. So with that, I will take a motion to adjourn. So um, second. All right. <laughs> I heard Sharon, then I heard Joe. So thank you. Uh, Jean, how do you vote? Yes. Joe? Yes. Sharon? Yes. Catherine? Yes. And I vote yes as well. So thanks, everybody. Meeting is adjourned.